Hey. Yes, man. Who knew? Long time no, no see. Where, where the hell are you? Uh, I'm on Cape Cod. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so okay. nice uh, for those who are international watching this, Cape Cod is about an hour and a bit south of Boston. So we're here uh, at a place where there's fresh air and not a lot of people. So it, I'm not complaining. It, it's good. But uh, I would love to be back in the lab. We have some research that's important for COVID as well. So I'm feeling everybody's frustration. Um, it's just, as I was saying, Ian, you might have heard, now's not the time to open up big cities. You think so? I do. Um, we, let's I, I mean, argue I, about that. No, no, no. I actually want I don't want to argue. I more want to get into it. I mean, I look, I, I, I come at this with the view that when we are fighting a war, like we did after 9-11, fought a war on terror, the policymakers overwhelmingly focus on how do we win that war? And as a consequence, they overshoot. And so, I mean, Patriot Act, TSA, Afghanistan, I mean, trillions and trillions of dollars to make sure that we don't have another terrorist attack in the United States. And the knock-on effects for everything else are horrible. So, I mean, obviously, I feel a lot of that right now um, in the U.S. and in lots of other countries, in Japan and Singapore, and the economic damage is astonishingly high. And, and obviously, I don't want to see deaths. I, don't, and I, I want to see us defeat this virus. But my inclination as a political scientist, knowing nothing about the disease, my inclination is just to knee-jerk believe that if left to our own devices, we are likely to overshoot in the war against the virus and destroy economies as a consequence of that. So when I see things like Sweden, I want to really press hard into seeing what they're doing there, what they're not doing there, how the economy is going. So I'd love to hear from you what you think about that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm monitoring Sweden like a lot of us. Um, they do seem to have, uh, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, three times the amount of uh, deaths so far in, in the region. But you could argue that it's going to happen anyway because, you know, no vaccine in sight. Um, and remdesivir, the new news is that it doesn't stop deaths or it doesn't lower the mortality. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're in a situation where we're, we have an experiment in real time and we're making adjustments all the time. But fortunately, we have other countries to look at the future. You know, they're ahead of us. Uh, you look at China. I know you, you, you know a fair bit about that. I've been watching your, uh, your shows. Thank you for all of that, by the way. Brilliant. If anyone hasn't watched... Ian recently or ever, you got it. You got to watch what he's what he he broadcasts. Um, but yeah, to the point. I look at Australia, which is a very similar country to the U.S. Or at least it's very similar to California in population yeah. size, climate, um, and um, you know, California, L.A. disaster, Sydney, Australia. They basically they're done with it. They're going back to work uh, next week. So it's very different. Um, attitude, what, what I think it all comes down to, and I'll, I want to just get to the point here. Um, it goes back about uh, 200 and so years, 200, let's give it 230 years. Uh, why would I say that? Because Australia never had a revolution. They accepted authority for the most part, um, and they have a monarchy, and they think that government is there generally to help them when there's a tough time, whereas we in the U.S., you know, we're, we're uh, I'm here because it, it's very free, but in a pandemic, it doesn't necessarily get you as far. Um, but we Americans, we don't like to listen to what to be told. And uh, right. what I'm seeing is that these numbers are not coming down uh, in cities like Boston and, and New York. Um, and that's because, uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's pretty scientifically evident uh, because people are not... Uh, staying indoors when, when they should. So Australia, for instance, uh, banned any gathering larger than two people. Now that sounds draconian, and it is, but they got it over and done with, with it within a couple of months. So they ripped the Band-Aid off and they're done with it and hopefully they can stay low. Hopefully it doesn't come back. Uh, it doesn't look like it will based on Southeast Asia's performance so far. Right. We'll have to see. So bottom line is we're in a country where because of rebellious nature, I, I think we're gonna have a long drawn out period um, do we rip the bandaid off? Do we say, let's let some older people die uh, potentially when they may not have to? I mean, you, you can weigh that up. But I would also argue from an economic standpoint, 
that compared to 1918, our elderly are much more valuable. Uh, we have a lot more of them. We have 10% rather than 2.5% of our population is over 65. Um, actually over 70, I should say. And they're actually, they're valuable. Economists have put quite, quite a high price, uh, about $350,000 on every one of these elderly people. I believe it's over the age of 70. So, you know, it's expensive to, to let people die too, not let, let alone social problems um, and tragedy. But that, I mean, I, I agree with everything you just said um, without having a conclusion that um, that means that we shouldn't open any cities in the U.S. Um, oh, I didn't say that. I, 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 no, no, no. Well, before you said we shouldn't open before. The, but the reason I asked you the question is you said we shouldn't be opening cities right now. And well, it, I, that's not clear. It's not clear to me. That's the answer. Uh, I mean, look, I, I am, as I said, my, my inclination is to believe that because of how horrifying this disease is, because we don't understand it, people are scared of it. We want to defeat it. You're dying in a horrible way, in a painful way, um, by yourself, under quarantine, frequently without even pastoral care. I mean, this is freaking a lot of people out. And I think that when things like that happen, like when the, the two tw towers came down um, on 9-11, and I was here in New York for that too, um, you can't even imagine. You see the people jumping out of those buildings and you say, I can have nothing like that can ever happen again. And, and I... And again, I worry because people, people are going to die um, from our economy collapsing. Uh, there's no question. Uh, people are going to die from the additional 10% of unemployment that we are now experiencing because we are inducing a coma upon our economy and, and our need to take care of these people. And so, I mean, when I see Sweden, um, what I see is a higher death rate right now than in the Nordics, but um, not a death rate that's out of whack with people that die from all sorts of other things, frankly, um, in the Nordics. And I also think that over three, because I expect that this economic recession is gonna last three years. I think that the ability to get our economy, right, maybe that's the point is, you know the healthcare side of this. I don't, but I know the economic side of this. And um, I mean, I, I think we're looking at 20 percent unemployment in the United States at the peak. Mm -hmm. But I think that we are not going to be back to normal until there is a vaccine. I mean, just yesterday in Tokyo, the Olympic Committee said that they probably can't have the Olympics even next summer, next summer, unless there's a vaccine. People are not going to be getting back on planes for non-essential travel. They're not going to restaurants for, you know, in, in ways they did before. They're, they're not going to be going to nightclubs or sporting events or stuff like that. Uh, and the tech companies are going to be vastly more disruptive, which means so many more people will lose their jobs. Now, if the baseline is that, if the base, and, and the amount of money, we've already spent 10% uh, of, of our GDP just on a couple of months of relief, no stimulus. If, if you're thinking that the baseline is we're going to need to do that for three years, so the, the, the decisions you're taking now about opening or not reopening economy are going to be cost on top of that, then I'll feel like we've got the right context. Because I, I feel like people right now understand a lot about the context of the healthcare side, because that's the part that hits first, as opposed to the economic part that we, we haven't really suffered at all economically yet, but we're, by God, we're going to. And that, that's what worries me. Well, yeah, so, so I, I agree. Um, maybe you misunderstand my position. I'm a moderate. Um, I look at the data and I, I draw conclusions as best I can. I'm not an expert in everything. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't open up any part of the country. Uh, I think it's actually dangerous to make generalizations about the entire country because we're 50 separate countries here. Um, but what I am saying is that for us to get into a point where, there, where we feel comfortable doing daily activities, for people to feel comfortable about travel, about going back to work, uh, we, we should bring the numbers down to a point that are manageable and that, that they won't explode again to the, the high numbers. Other, otherwise, the government's going to send us straight back to home and the stock market's going to crash worse than it was. Um, and that's not going to help anybody. So I'm, I'm talking about let's have a soft landing. But, you know, in, in places where we 
where we see that there's few infections, remote and, and non-popular states, open those up. You know, they're independent. They can decide these things for themselves. But in places like Boston, where things are still looking horrifically bad, if we opened up today, uh, it, it would just continue. And you might say, well, you know, that's fine. But I think a lot of people would be scared to even go out under those conditions. Um, I'm all for economics. I mean, I've got businesses. I've got 12 companies that are suffering on, on yeah. about this. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to look at the, the, the best case scenario out of the, you know, a lot of tough choices. But I think it, it's, it's, it's navigating somewhere in between those two extremes. I, I also worry because um, I think that in much of the developing world, um, the answers are going to be driven much more by the economic imperatives and by their capacity. I mean, they don't have the healthcare system. Their people are close to subsistence level, so they can't afford to close the economy the way we can in the United States. They're, they're living, many of them, in slums, 25% in Brazil, 50%, 40, 50% in India, 70% in Nigeria. So social distancing is impossible anyway. I mean, I worry that in much, where most of the world lives, fundamentally, we are reverting to herd immunity. And if it turns out that the United States and Europe is saying, no, 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 we're going to close our economies, and these guys are actually going to open them, it also implies that our need to keep globalization at bay is going to be a lot greater. Their ability to get people into our countries to have remittances, which in many cases are more than 10% of those countries' GDP, even a place like Mexico, never mind the Philippines, I mean, that's going to be dangerous. So I just, again, I, I agree with everything mm. you're saying, David, and, I, and I'd love to talk to you and ask you a little bit, since we have both of us here, about mm. some of the healthcare parameters of this. I just think that I feel like so far, because, of, because the disease shocked us and we know so little about it, um, the fo human healthcare impact, and I think in very short order, we're going to need to, to start talking really, really in a, an incredibly hard way about the trade-offs that are real trade-offs that, I mean, almost every, this is going to be the hardest decision made probably for most leaders in the world in their entire lives are be about how and when to reopen their economies. And Lord knows, I'd hate to have to make that decision. But I know that I want any leader that's making that decision to be making it with a full understanding of the trade-offs on both sides. Yeah. I don't it's want them true. doing it in a, with a war mentality. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm on the healthcare side, Harvard Medical School. It's about as conservative medically as you can get. Um, one of the reasons I was immediately kicked out of my lab. Uh, the... You're right that, that it doesn't look like there are any policies locally here, at least, that are being based on economics yet. Because if you raise it like you just did, you're, you're immediately uh, labeled as heartless, blah, blah, blah. Like, look what happened to Elon Musk today. Uh, just slammed by, yeah. by the world. I, you're an I slammed him. I slammed him, too. <laughs> I loved it. Right, I, right. Free Tesla's I, 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 not, I am not a techno utopian, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I am. But, um, You're closer. Yeah, I mean, but you, it, you've it, got a heart. I don't know if Elon has a heart. I really don't. Uh, well, he cares about the species. I'm not sure he cares about the individuals of that species. That's the, well, I, yeah, and I'm, I'm exactly the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that means you have a heart too, sir. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, the species, you know, life will go on. You know, we can go extinct, but life's going to go on for at least another billion years. So what's the big deal? But, you know, do we care about our family? Do we care about our friends? Do we care about the economy, people's jobs? Yeah, absolutely. That's what really matters now within our lifetimes. And that's why, you know, you and I do what we do. Um, but it's really important that we, we talk about it because I find that we've got such polarized views right now. It started off, we're kind of narrow where we kind of agreed, let's shut this down, let's do that, and we were all good to go. We all had our, we had masks, and we're, most of us were excited about that. Um, some of us wear them, not everybody, as you know. But the, the point here is that I find that we're, we're diverging. We've got some people saying, let's all just go back to normal life, and others saying absolutely nobody can go out of their house. 
other than essential people. And people are getting antsy, they're, they're getting frustrated. I mean, people have lost their jobs, millions of people. Um, and people are starting to lose it. I mean, look, you know, Elon can't, couldn't take it. You know, multiply that by 300 million people here in this country. Uh, well, at least 200 million that, that are thinking about this. It's tough. It really is. And I worry that if, unless we have an open dialogue where people are free to voice opinions like we are today and disagree, um, then it's not going to be productive and we're just going to end up, you know, I, I do worry about being in a, a 1930s situation where, you know, we're talking about now the, the 2030s where we're going to have extreme right wing. Um, we're going to have a lot of poverty potentially. And like you said, forget about, um, you know, a few nursing homes, which is a complete disaster. If the world goes into, uh, you know, a, a cold war or God, I you know, hope not a, a third world war. This is going to be just uh, you know, like a picnic. All we're doing is staying home and, you know, getting on Zoom calls. We're going to wish we could go back in and stay at home. Um, I mean, I, I do think one of the things that makes me more optimistic when you, you know, look at this compared to 1918, I mean, you, you mentioned that older people are quote unquote worth more. Um, but, uh, you know, frankly, one of the reasons for that is because society is so much wealthier. So if we were to have a depression, and let's keep in mind, we don't even have a definition for depression because we only really had the one in modern times. So we know this is bigger than any recession we've ever had, including the Great Recession. But we don't really know what a depression is and no one wants to call it. It was kind of like when the World Health Organization didn't want to call it a pandemic because, you know, that, that freaks people out. Then they finally kind of had to. Cat was out of the bag. Um, but... The fact is that society is so much wealthier that even if you were to have a 10, a 15 percent global economic contraction, we would be coming at it with a lot more capacity to get through it, a lot more capacity to redistribute wealth if we want to, a lot more capacity to help ensure that people don't suffer the depredation that they did back during uh, the 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 great you know the the the, uh, the 1918 Spanish flu. Um, but what worries me is is precisely it's the politics, the dysfunctionality of the politics, and the fact that we are so unwilling to make decisions that would reduce a level of inequality that is far greater than anything that we've experienced in our lives, or that you and I would find remotely acceptable in an advanced industrial economy. That that's what makes this so horrible. I mean, you know, you and I both know that the healthcare burdens that everyone is experiencing now, it's so much worse on the poorest because they're the ones that can't socially distance. They're the ones that aren't in the knowledge economy. You and I can work at home. You can work on the Cape. I can work anywhere I want. These poor bastards, they have to go in there much more exposed. You see African-Americans getting these diseases and dying much higher percentage of their population in the United States. But it's also true that when we talk about the people that are losing their jobs, same people. So the inequality on both sides is going to get so much worse, especially in this country, the country that has the most wealth and in principle, the most capacity to do something about it. You know, I mean, one more thing for me, and then I really want to go to the healthcare side, is that, you know, I blame China for the cover up. I, I blame China for, for not telling their own people or us while 500,000 Chinese left the country and 5 million traveled from Wuhan. I blame China for this pandemic, I do. But, but you know what? They lied to every country in the world at the same time. And, 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 and that means we all found out about it. The Americans, the South Koreans, the Germans, we all found out at the same time, leaving aside our intelligence on, yes. on this earlier. And the fact that our government is incapable of leading the response, not only internationally, but even domestically, compared to other large economies is unacceptable and is not the country that I grew up believing in. It's not the country that I'm patriotic and support. That, that's what deeply, deeply disturbs me. Right. Well, I, I saw you get stuck into uh, Kyo Tenkai. Uh, he was uh, on the defensive. Um, and, you know, I, I think that... The Chinese you, ambassador, yeah. You, you were right. Yeah. So he's the, the ambassador for, uh, for China here. In, in America. So he, he was on the defensive and I thought you, you had some good points about how uh, they were very slow to get on this. Um, on the other hand, um, I, I sympathize in that um, 
once once it was out of the bag, so to speak, and literally and figuratively speaking, um, there was some communication. Now, I don't have insight into the Chinese government. I'm, I'm not like you, but I, I do have insight into Chinese scientists. Um, and they, they've been wonderful, the ones that I've contacted and worked with. Now, and sharing information up online the, the day that they publish it, you know, it's all, we scientists seem to be on a much better level than, than the government, which at least, you know, is something. Um, but I, I, on social media, I've, I've said some things about Chinese scientists, which is, you know, they're not all bad. You know, some people saying, oh, we can't trust anything. That's not true. And there are some very, very generous people that I've, I know over there. Um, I'm leaving politics aside. That's not my business. No, I don't know anything. completely. And you but hear I, from Bill Gates and all people. these guys, they're working with so many people on the ground, on the tech side. We want collaboration with Chinese scientists. Like it would really be helpful if we could get that. Right. But it's dangerous to, to come out and pr protect our, uh, you know, like a Cold War, war adver adversary. I found that on social media. People were upset that I was defending some aspects of China, but you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up for whoever I see uh, is worthy of that. Um, in terms of tests, so... You did um, see what they said about Australia yesterday, right? What's that? Uh, the Chinese government said that Australia is like a piece of gum that gets stuck on your shoe. And sometimes you just need to kick and scrape it off, you know? What's, that's, uh, what's Australia done to China? They're giving them all their resources. What's the problem? Yeah, well, they've been somewhat critical, like the Americans have, of the original sin of the pandemic. You know, there's not not surprise there. I mean, one of the top allies of the U.S. on this has been Oz, frankly, especially this government. But so, but tell me, what what do you think we're getting? What are we getting wrong um, around? I mean, what are some common misconceptions that someone like I might have um, about about this disease, about how we're fighting it, about the parameters of it, what it looks like. Again, I mean, I, I'm watching what Fauci has to say, obviously, and, yeah. you know, talking to some of the epidemiologists, but you're, you're a real specialist. I'd love to hear, since, you know, we've got each other live, uh, mm -hmm. some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, right. Uh, well, so I'm not an MD. I'm a PhD. I read a lot of uh, papers coming out around the world every day. So I'm synthesizing those. My specialty is genetics. People know me for the body's defenses against aging, but we've been working on inflammation um, and viral attacks for a long time. I've started uh, three companies that work on this. So I'm giving, you know, some of the, the caveats and the pros as to why you would take anything I say seriously. Um, but I certainly don't dish out medical advice. That's not my qualification. Um, so you but, can't tell me what to take right now. Okay, that's fine. I mean, if Trump can do it, I don't see why you can't. Yeah, look what happened there. Uh, no, I will not do that. But um, I can always say what I do, that, that's pretty safe. Um, and in my book, I do, as you know. Uh, so what are the misconceptions? Well, look, it's been frustrating because what, what's happened is um, the leaders and, and, and pundits have said, do this and then do that, and then this is wrong. Sorry, we got this right, like chloroquine. Should you wear masks? Do they help? Do they not? Um, so, you know, let me summarize. Um, masks help. They definitely help. Um, even a scarf will help stop you touching your face. Um, I have a newsletter, which you can, uh, you know, we'll, we'll post the link to that. It goes through the various ways you can make a mask and what, what the best ways to cover that up. So masks, masks do help, but in the home, it doesn't matter. If you go to a hospital, you should wear one though. I hope the vice president um, will one day listen to that. Uh, the other misconception- You know why he didn't do that. It's because he didn't want to look like a weenie in front of Trump who was going to give him hell if he wore. I'm sure that's what the issue was. They told him in advance, you have to wear a mask. And he showed up anyway and didn't wear one. I mean, that, he wouldn't have done that on his own. That is, it is just massively dysfunctional over there. You gotta be an alpha male, you know, it's mm. crazy. Yeah, yeah, you, you're right. But yeah, when, when you're with patients, for goodness sakes. Um, so yeah, th these are helpful um, to stop the spread and stop you touching your face. Chloroquine probably helps a little bit, but you've got to give it early. Again, I'm saying based on the data, I don't know for a fact, but it's not as promising as it first seemed when it came out of China in a couple of um, compassionate use studies. You always want to trust placebo controlled trials like this new remdesivir study that looks promising for symptoms, but not for survival. Um, Actemra, which is the drug that slows the, uh, the cytokine storm, not very helpful, but somewhat helpful. Again, doctors are telling me that they're not super excited, but it does seem to help 
Um, the disease is becoming one of a coagulash coagulopathy. It's called. Um, you get inflammation of I'm the blood vessels. I'm not going to try to say right? that. Yeah, yeah. Coagulopathy. Yeah. No, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Yeah. So a DIC for short. What happens is that with all of these cytokines, which are chemicals that cause inflammation, the body is overreacting to the remnants of the virus, um, and it, your body starts to clot. Um, and then to dissolve those clots and reclot, and the microvasculature, as it's called, in your body, in your brain, in your lungs, in your heart, your kidney, they start to clog up, and that's a disaster. You know, that's like having the bends. Um, and try to trying to stop that's real problematic. And even the drug like Actemra, which dampens one of the cytokine pathways called IL-6. There are a lot of other ones. There's IL-1, uh, TNF alpha, and what you need to do is dampen them all. So with some of the work that I'm doing is to try and dampen them all through what's called the inflammasome. Mm -hmm. Other misconceptions, um, let's see, is uh, can you catch it off surfaces? Probably mm -hmm. not as easily as you think. Uh, I, I, my read of it is that at the shop, um, probably if you touch something, you're not going to get it. If, if you get a delivery, it's, you're not going to get it. I don't wash my food. I leave it on the bench for a day, and that seems to be sufficient so far. But where you will catch it from is, someone who has no symptoms, but you know, has coughed on their hand, shakes your hand, touches an elevator button just before you did, that's the way to catch it. Um, and so it's humans that are the problem. It's not really as much deliveries that you get. So uh, when you saw the 21% of New Yorkers that have antibodies, 30% Chelsea Mass, um, you know, how does that make you feel about um, the level of transmissibility compared to what we think? How does it make you think about timeline around potential herd immunity, that sort of stuff? Yeah. Well, again, the truth is somewhere in between. It's definitely not 2% of the population, which is the official number uh, in most Western countries, including here. And, it, and it's, it's probably not more than 30%. Somewhere in between. The, the study that caught my attention uh, greatly was they tested pregnant women and also homeless people in a shelter and it, w it was yet yeah, in the 20s now these are select groups right um and, and then there was the santa monica one i think that these are statistical sampling issues some of the tests are actually false positive uh that you can do pcr tests i've written about this on social media too if you want to check that out uh, PCR tests can be false positive by now these labs that are doing the PCR tests, which are the ones that amplify up the genetic material of the virus. It's everywhere, right? It's going to be on the walls. It's going to be on the benches. If you are sloppy with your pipetting, you'll probably pick up stray molecules. You only need one or two to pick it up. So some of it could be false positives. Um, some of it will undoubtedly be false negatives as well. Um, I have, I posted also on social media, I had one of these strips Test strips, actually. Um, oh, show I'm, and tell. Look at this. Yeah, so this one, I just have a few samples because I was distributing tests around the planet um, out of China, actually. This is one of them. This is um, what is the immunological test for the uh, antibodies, the IgG that forms after you've had it. Now, this is by no means have perfect. Have you had it? No. Yeah. No, I, I did a test just to test it out, and it was negative. Um, but the, the false positive rate on this is, oh, it's about 10% and the same for the false negative. So it's, it's good, but it's not great. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. um, go with it, but there are three, three tests now that are available in the U S one new one that just came out. It's a salivary test from UCSF, which is 99% accurate, uh, which looks great. So finally technology is catching up with where we should have been early on. Uh, one of the things that frustrates the heck out of my colleagues and I uh, is the CDC's screw up of the first PCR test. Um, what you do to test whether you have the RNA in your body is you have what are called primers which bind either at both ends of the, of the genetic material. And the CDC had a complicated one. They had one in the middle as well, so I had three. Um, and the, the primers, as they're called, just weren't designed well. Um, one of my colleagues said, and I won't name him because he'll get into trouble, but he said, my PhD students could have done a better job. So, you know, and he should know because he's developing tests. Now, that shouldn't have happened. We should have had a test that was world-class, worked first time, just like in Australia. Um, and that really would have helped. But, you know, it's easy to say that now. But I'm, I'm optimistic that these new tests coming on board, 
and ones that I'm actually help, helping to develop will be uh, the gold standard going forward. Cool. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm certainly, so I, I've been looking at all of these different vectors that people have for solution. The one being, you know, the far, the far side of it being before we get to vaccine, the herd immunity issue, the contact tracing issue, the we've got to do vastly more testing issue. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the where everybody wears masks and engages in social distancing. It does feel to me, again, as a lay person, that um, we don't need all of those things. That, that, that a narrower constellation of those things should allow us to open the economy faster. Like when I hear the fact that we are nowhere close, that we're just not gonna get to the 5 million tests uh, a day in the United States that the Harvard study is requiring. But if we could get everyone, if we had N95 or the equivalent mask that everyone could actually wear all the time and socially distance, couldn't we do away with contact tracing and still have an acceptable amount of, you know, of, of, of disease control containment and also mm -hmm. be able to get people back to work and have livings again? And it, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that's the right answer, but it seems like we should be able to have a discussion like that. Right. Right. Um, and when you speak to epidemi epidemiologists, uh, you spoke to Larry Brilliant, which, by the way, was was brilliant. Um, he's, I've known him for 20 years. I, yeah, I love that what guy. a guy. He's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he, he's the kind of guy that I, I would listen to, and it sounds like you would too. Um, and But he knows his stuff. So the, the point is that there probably are ways that we can get through this without waiting for these tests to be ready, certainly in, in cities where things are coming down to a reasonable level and, and not continuing to to explode or, or level off. Um, I do think, though, that that technology can solve this. I, I, I do, I'm kind of utopian in that way. Now, let, let's quickly speak about the, the apps that you can get. Yeah. Um, and I also, before we go, I want to talk about mutations because I've seen a lot of people come up with questions about these mutations in the, the virus. But so contact tracing apps, so Google, I uh, said so Larry, an ex-Google guy, was talking about how excited he was about Google and Apple. Working with Apple, yeah, which the yeah. Germans have just backed off and said they're gonna work with the Apple system, Google Apple system, as opposed to developing their own. So, I mean, one thing to feel good about in the United States is that our tech companies are going to be in such a dominant position vis-a-vis -vis our allies going forward. Mm -hmm. And that does matter for our economy. Right. But anyway, right. go ahead. But we should have had this a long time ago. Singapore had uh, their version of this uh, probably two months ago now. I downloaded it onto my phone thinking this was going to save America. And guess what? It only works if you're in Singapore. That was very frustrating, actually. Um, and but what they did and it wasn't so completely working in Singapore. They only had about twenty percent of the people downloaded, so it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't. At, they said I've heard that they needed like at least fifty or sixty percent to really make it effective, right? Right. But I've actually my my I'm of the I'm aware that Australians uh, a million people have signed up for that now. So it seems to be in a few hours. Yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah, so that yeah. might be okay. I think if if you have a government that you know isn't so uh, or uh, autocratic, it would be okay. The problem, though, I see is that we needed this a long time ago. Uh, the Singaporeans opened up their source code to the to the app uh, middle of March. So I don't know if I don't actually know if Apple and Google are using that source code, um, but it it couldn't arrive you know soon enough for, for this. But I, I question whether it's going to be like Australia, or it's going to be like Singapore here. What do you think? Singapore. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Of course. It's, but that's why I'm saying I don't, but I don't actually think that we're going to need that. I mean, I got, we're fighting a war. And so we're saying we have to have all these things. And I, I mean, I'm not saying that we can just do good enough. We can't. But the, because the trade-offs on the economic side are so dire, are so bad, I just want to be holding our feet to the fire a little bit more on what's good enough. I mean, our population is considerably younger than Italy's. Doesn't that matter? A lot of our country is a hell of a lot less dense than Italy or Spain. Doesn't that matter? I mean, like we have a lot of, you know, sort of internalized advantages compared to other places that have really gotten destroyed by this. And look, New York City is a bad situation. Don't get me wrong. And we've really mishandled it. But that's also not most of the country. So and the numbers are coming down right now in most of the country. So it appears that 
we are capable of flattening the curve, even with Americans that don't listen to authority and go out on Newport Beach and frolic and so forth. So, you know, I just, I just want, I want some common sense on both sides. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I just think that America is, is the worst place to be experimenting with. Um, you know, that sounds crazy, but, you know, I, I put up a, a picture of, uh, where was it? Um, Newport Beach versus Bondi Beach in yeah. California and Sydney. Right. What a difference. One was empty, one was full with people last weekend. That makes a difference. Um, and even if we do go out, and we will go out into the world, hopefully sooner than later, um, how many people are going to bother with these things? I think that we might end up being the laughing stock of the planet. You know, China and Australia and New Zealand will be back to work and Americans will be sent back home after a couple of months because no one's paying attention to what they're told by uh, the authorities. That would be the worst case scenario, I would think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually suspect that the truth is in the middle. Um, I mean, we're the laughing stock because people laugh at Trump, but you know what, they don't laugh at his face. And the reason they don't is not because they think he's smart when he's one-on-one, -on -one. it's because they're concerned about the impact of uh, going after uh, the president of the world's most powerful country. And coming out of this, our banks are stronger than the Europeans, but they're gonna be major financial crashes. So we're gonna, the dollar will be strong. We're the global energy leader. We're the global food producing leader. We're gonna, we've got all the tech firms. They're becoming much more powerful than they were. Um, our, our, the, the, the geography of the United States is massively advantageous. You're not near army, all of these things. So then there's a question of how are we gonna handle it with our own population? Uh, because again, the geopolitical balance is not against the United States, it's actually in favor of the United States. The question is, can, are we defeating ourselves? Are, 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 we, are we losing the trust of Americans in what the United States stands for? And that, that we've done a lot of over the last 40 years. Right. And I fear that with this crisis, that's getting worse. That, that's, that's what worries me the most. And, you, but, but again, I really don't think I mean, yeah, that does need to be about trust in politicians. And I think that the damage, the thing that Trump has done the worst is that he's really undermined science. He has, he's made it harder for Americans to want to believe the expertise and authority of political leaders. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and therefore, and behavior will, I mean, Bolsonaro in Brazil has done the same thing with a country with lower educational rates and, and you can watch on the Google uh, geotracing apps after Bolsonaro was saying that social distancing just went right down. And the, be the behavior is affected by stupidity of leaders in high office. And that, that's where Trump is really going to have an impact ultimately on the United States. I agree. The, wh wh where I think it, it, it's worth clarifying is what I've seen from my vantage as a scientist is that uh, pre-COVID, I thought we were headed to a world where people can say whatever they want and every, anybody, uh, anything goes. But it finally, I think most people are now really desperate for facts. They, they don't want to trust what politicians say um, or engineers who talk about healthcare. Um, and so I think that the, the world is, is, is being nudged back to where we were in the 1950s, where scientists actually do have a say in society uh, and are more respected and hopefully better funded as well uh, in their research so we can get ready for this. Um, but I, I think part of it is the blame of this device that we're using right now and that we're in our phones um, and any, anything goes, anyone can say anything and it's a, it's a food fight 24 seven, 365 days a year, whereas it wasn't before. And so that's why these extremes have emerged in politics, um, but hopefully uh, not yet in science, where, where we have to be factual. It's about the only place in the world and profession you can be only 100% factual. Now, I know you and I both have to jump at the, uh, the bottom of the hour here. You have not talked about mutations yet, and I do not know if we're going to hit with five different types of coronavirus that we're not going to be immune to. So explain to me what that means. Yeah, so here's how my thought is evolving. Uh, so most viruses, but particularly RNA viruses like this one, will mutate and mutate. They're very bad at copying their genetic materials, like the flu. Um, and most of these mutations actually make the virus worse or neutral. And that's really what we've seen. But there are a couple of exceptions. There are a couple of mutations that have 
affected the ability of the virus to replicate more quickly and kill human cells in dishes, not in people yet. Um, but also the fact that we've now got reservoirs of the virus, probably in domestic cats, in minks, though you could probably fix that. Um, who knows what other animal this is going to spread to. Tigers in the Bronx Zoo. Yeah, I'm not so much worried about that. I'm going to avoid going near the tigers. But yeah, but it's true. Cats are at a minimum. Fortunately, not dogs. But he, here's the issue. And I my, my thinking is that the, we're going to be stuck with coronavirus uh, and versions of it possibly for decades. Um, that's a scary thought, but it's possible. And I don't think it's doomsday scenario where the vaccine won't work, but it may be like the flu where we need booster shots every year and it's going to change slowly and we just have to constantly fight this thing. And I agree that the herd immunity that way is the, is the best response. Um, because otherwise we're, we're always going to be behind the eight ball playing catch up. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I mean, it's, I mean, I certainly feel like in the developing world, that's where we're going. Um, and uh, I do think that our political leaders are not yet geared up. I and mean, when you put your expertise and mine together on this, and you realize what that means for the manifestation of this globally, given how limited the leadership is, how limited the coordination is, um, I think the impact is actually a lot greater than our political leaders understand or have anticipated. And I hope we're going to be ready to pay for this because we're going to have to. We are. We are. And uh, it's interesting to live through an historical moment. I didn't feel like there was anything besides 9-11 and maybe some wars. But it, that was still distant, except for those people in New York. I was in Boston. But this, this is a planetary change. Um, and the question is, will we ever go back to normal? And how long will that take? You've said three years at least economically, socially, probably just as long. I'm hoping that we'll have the roaring 20s, uh, but it may take, you know, a few years to get there. I just think that, um, you know, it's not like this necessarily makes the world entirely different, but it does really speed up a lot of things that have been happening. So the displacement and disruptiveness of tech companies, I think you have 10 years happening in 18 months. The same thing in growth and inequality, the same thing in U.S.-China tensions, the same things in unsustainability of the Eurozone, yeah. the same thing. Um, when, when, when you talk about, uh, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, move from, uh, from globalization um, to fragmented and localization in supply chains and trade. So, I mean, all of those things, you know, we knew they were coming, but we weren't prepared for them. And we thought we had time. And now it turns out, no, we don't. We actually have to respond to it right now. And, yeah. you know, we're going to see if, if our leaders or if new leaders um, are going to be up to that challenge. And I mean, it's very exciting to be able to live through and watch it and experience it, and maybe even be a part of the solution. But I mean, for most people in the world, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be pretty, pretty panic inducing. It's going to be pretty dangerous stuff. It is. Well, on that note, um, it, you know, I, I would always like to end on a high note, but you know, this is serious stuff and the world yep. is going to be impacted. So we'll leave it on that note.